Hello everybody, this is Tim here again, and today we are doing the commentary, finally, for Friday the 13th. I did the Not Run M Street commentaries pretty much like all last year, and so we finally decided to move on to Friday the 13th, and of course, next up eventually will be Halloween, but now we're going to start the Friday the 13th commentaries with the original 1980 classic. So, without further ado, if you'd like to link up, I'm at, set your movie to zero, pretty much I'm at zero as well, and counting down, one, two, Three, pressing play, now. Let's kick it off, baby! <laughs> Got the Paramount logo coming up. I always like to like count the stars that are on this mountain eventually. I mean, I eventually started doing that. There's 22, I believe. Yeah, Friday the 13th came out in 1980. It was pretty much meant to be like a small little horror film that was meant to like cash in on uh, the success of Halloween. and It did. You know, it did. It came at the right time, just perfect placement in uh, slasher movie history. All the slasher films are pretty much cribbing from, like, a Psycho. Like, even though I believe Peeping Tom did come out before Psycho, or maybe a month before, or it was made at exactly the same time as Psycho, I'm not for sure, but they came out around the exact same time. Even though that's true, it was really Psycho, the original, that really, like, catapulted the slasher genre to kick it off. Because everything that came after Psycho was all cribbing from the popularity of Psycho. Uh, Black Christmas, which um, Halloween cribbed from that, and Black Christmas cribbed from Psycho. And then Friday the 13th cribbed from Halloween, and then so on and so forth. But yeah, I, I love the first person, first person, like, view here going on. It's pretty cool. Yes, kind of like taken from Halloween and all that, but it, it works here. It works here well. I will say this. This film is not as good watching it now uh, as it was when I first reviewed it. When I reviewed it for the first time, I believe I called it like a slasher masterpiece or even like an awesome flick. Watching it again, I don't think this movie is like that level of quality. Like taking off the nostalgia goggles and just watching it as a film today I don't think it's that good. Like, if I reviewed this now, I would give it a solid 3 out of 4. I think this is a good slasher movie. It is good. But honestly, I don't think this is a great or amazing movie. It cribbed a bit too much, maybe, from other slasher films. Like, the ending with Mrs. Voorhees and all that, and how she's, like, speaking with Jason through her and all that. Like, she has a split personality. It's pretty cool and well acted. But at the same time, it just feels like a complete rip from Psycho. And that's the thing. Even though Halloween, like, cribbed a lot from Black Christmas, it still took what? took elements from Black Christmas and did his own thing with it and elevated those elements to become something better and because that movie's way better than Black Christmas. This movie just kind of takes the elements but doesn't really reinvent them or do anything amazing with them. It just kind of has them here. But it executes them still in a fun way. So yeah, watching this now, I don't think that this movie is amazing. I think it is a good, solid slasher film. I think what it gave birth to with the franchise and Jason is honestly more iconic than this movie itself. But still, I do think that this is a solid 3 out of 4 good, fun movie. And I do think it's well shot. These two counselors that start out in the opening of the movie that are murdered by Mrs. Voorhees, which, no, of course, there's spoilers here. Anybody who's listened to this commentary has obviously seen uh, Friday 13th Part 1 or most of these movies by now, or at least knows something about it in the general zeitgeist. But yeah, um, I've, always, I've always wanted to speculate, or always speculated, that these two counselors murdered in the opening here were probably the ones that were supposed to have been watching Jason like when he drowned. That's what I'm, the vibe I've always kind of gotten, that these were the two that were like screwing or whatever, you know, instead of watching Jason and they caused his death. Like these two were probably the main culprits. That's kind of the vibe I've always gotten, and that's why Mrs. Voorhees kills him. That would make the most sense to me, logically. <clears throat> but yeah. I've always thought I've also I've also always thought it was interesting that we don't get like anything about Jason's father in this movie. Now we're probably gonna get something about Jason's father in a new prequel series that's being made. It's gonna I believe it's gonna be like a pre-make. Which means, which is code word for, it's going to be like an origin story for Jason, but at the same time, it's going to probably exist in its own continuity. But you could still see it as probably like the basic origin story for the character, even in the original continuity. And let's be honest, like by the time you get up to like number 10 or 11 or even 8, continuity does not really matter that much in Friday the 13th. Like, um, it doesn't. Like most of the movies, the later movies are just for fun, and that's fine. Like, in terms of this series, this is my favorite slasher series. I don't think it has the best writing of all the slasher series, by far. 
I think uh, the best Halloween and best nightmare films are better, the better movies than a lot of these uh, Friday Thirteenth movies. But I do think overall, as a franchise, this is the most consistent in quality of all the series. Mostly because yes, it is so simple, but also because it is so entertaining. This is just the most fun, like pure entertainment, popcorn wise of the franchises, and that's the reason why Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, and Halloween caught on so much compared to other slasher series because they had the iconic killer, and each of them have like their own vibe going on. Like the Friday the Thirteenth one is the fun popcorn movie series. Halloween is the more um, suspense-driven, like, atmospheric one. And then Nightmare on Elm Street is the more, like, inventive, uh, supernatural, you know, uh, creative one with the kills and stuff with Freddy. Yeah, I like the Fire Thirteenth logo, like, crashing through glass. That's cool. And, of course, now we've had this long, like, lawsuit battle with this franchise and all that, which it really sucked. Um, at the same time now, though, that's pretty much over. Like, I believe in terms of the settlement now or, or how it was settled in court, Victor Miller owns the rights pretty much to this first film. Uh, he owns the rights to, like, the mother character and, uh, like, child Jason. While, uh, while Sean Cunningham owns the rights to, like, big adult Jason and the hockey mask and everything. So, like, if Sean Cunningham wanted to do a, um, new like Jason movie, it would have to be something like Jason Takes Manhattan or Jason Goes to Hell or Jason X or Freddy vs. Jason. Like another like somewhat standalone entry where it's just like Jason doing his thing. It's You know, it's got Jason's name in the title instead of like uh, something that referenced uh, like the mother and all that, I think. But you could just do that now because by now everybody pretty much knows the, the gist of these movies. Whereas Victor Miller can do something like... Uh, he can do, like, well, what's being done with the prequel series. And even in that prequel series, he's going to be able to use, like, adult Jason and the hockey mask and all that. Because one of the people who's producing the show is one of the people who worked uh, from, I believe, Horror Inc., who was also uh, one of the producers uh, on most of the Friday the 13th movies with Sean Cunningham. So they own the rights, part of the rights to some of these movies as well, or some of the franchise. So with the TV series... Victor Miller is going to be able to bypass uh, what he's able to use and use the adult Jason and the hockey mask because he's got people working on the series who own some of the rights to that as well. So he's pretty much got it made. I would still prefer like a new Friday the 13th movie, just a new Jason movie. I mean, I think we all would. But at this point, I'm willing to take what we can get. Like a, if it's just a fun like slasher series with Jason cutting people up and his mom cutting people up like eventually and like just kind of what I expected to be is something that's just like stretched out pretty much like a stretched out like origin prequel remake or reboot of the series that's just like stretched out to season length for multiple seasons and that could be entertaining at the same time though Friday 13th is such a simple idea that maybe stretching it out so much might not work but maybe it can I don't know we'll have to wait and see at the execution but it could be fun <clears throat> I can see it lasting for maybe like three seasons or something or four. Maybe five if they start to like take in elements from the later sequels. But yeah, we got Annie showing up here or whatever. And this is, you know, kind of a psycho twist thing. You think that she might be the uh, main character, but she turns out she isn't. But I've never really thought that with this movie. And other people have said they did, but... When she shows up here, I never really got the impression it was going to go that way, mostly because she just doesn't live long enough like the Janet Lee did in Psycho. I think the Tina character in Nightmare on Elm Street fits that more to where she gets killed off like partway through the movie and then it switches to Nancy. <clears throat> but I like like this small town vibe of this movie and all that. It works for the low budget and everything. Gives it that cool like 80s, you know, low budget horror movie feel that I really enjoy having grew up with these movies. Well, all slasher movies really. Got Crazy Ralph showing up, who's crazy as hell. He's also meant to be like a red herring suspect to where maybe he might be the killer, but I never really bought into that, that he might be the killer because he, he's so like old and crazy. I just never, I never bought into that. But at the same time, though, I appreciate that the movie is throwing out like red herrings like that, though. It is kind of neat. Of course, uh, the trucker just did an ass grab on the chick when he helped her get into the vehicle, <laughs> which is pretty funny.
Goes crazy Ralph riding off on his bicycle. Go, Ralph, go. I like this sequence right here because uh, it's a little bit of like drop history and all that about Crystal Lake. And you get the idea that Pamela has probably over the years like tried to do different things to keep the uh, camp from opening. Like poisoning the water and stuff like that and um, setting fire to some of the cabins and all that. And then when that didn't work, then she finally like resorts to murder. To like taking people out to keep the camp from opening. Just because it stirs up too many bad memories in her and all that because her son died there. I get that. I do think it would have been cooler though if uh, Sean Cunningham would have introduced Betsy Palmer in like an earlier scene at least once to set her up. So at least you can have her on your mind as a possible suspect. Even if it was just like a brief scene where she's like being really sweet and all that. I do ultimately like the fact, though, that this is like a, re a revenge story almost. Even though the people Pamela is killing aren't really like, you know, the people responsible for the murder of her son or the death of her son, I guess. But I do ultimately like the fact that in her mind it's like a revenge story. For a woman that, you know, just went crazy because of the loss of her child. Which is understandable. At the same time, of course, murdering all these people is wrong. It's interesting to think about what this series, or what this original movie started as, and what it was, and what it evolved into. We come in like this whole big, like, Jason franchise, like, multi-million dollar franchise. It's just pretty amazing that this small, like, low-budget horror movie just became that. And I'll say this. Pamela Voorhees as a character has like more going on for her story wise than Jason does at the same time though Jason is scarier and he's way more intimidating and he's way cooler so when he shows up you instantly gravitate to him way more than you ever did the Pamela Voorhees character when she shows up even though Betsy Palmer's acting is really good at the end of this um, when she's struggling though with Alice's character at the end it does seem a little bit hokey that she's like having such trouble with this one last girl and all that and um, most of the acting in this movie, I think, is fine. I don't think anybody's really a huge standout here, but I think for the most part, for a slasher flick, this is most this is pretty much mostly good acting. There is some weak points and some bad moments, but for the most part, it's good, fine acting. I do think it's a shame that Sean Cunningham like really didn't care about this series. Like he directed this first film, but he only did it just to try to make money or whatever to cash in on the horror craze or whatever that was being started with uh, Halloween or that really kicked off with Halloween. Um, at the time. But yeah, overall, he doesn't really care about the series. He never liked the Jason character and all that. He never liked Jason being the killer. And I'll say it is kind of, like, implausible of having Jason be the killer. But at the same time, Jason is, like, so cool when he shows up in part two. And so spooky with the bag over his head that you buy into it. And you just go with it. Because it's just, like, you know, so just cool and entertaining to watch. <clears throat> so even though it's somewhat implausible that he, like, came back from his drowning, it's still really entertaining to see. So you don't you don't care. You're able to overlook it because it's so entertaining. Of course, we've got Kevin Bacon here, who I believe this is his first actual role. I think he'd only done like a bit part before this in the movie Animal House. We got the practical Joker, Ned. We all know he's dead. Welcome to Camp Crystal Lake. <laughs> You'll never leave here alive. <laughs> that should be advertised on the <laughs> the logo outside. Got Steve Christie wearing his epic short shorts. You can tell this movie came out in like the transition from like 1970 to like directly to 1980 because some of the fashion here is still like somewhat 70s influenced. Another thing I will point out is, like, there was this whole, like, 
moniker like added to these movies or whatever because of critics who were talking about how this is like a misogynistic film because the women were being killed for having sex and all that. And that's just such a a low level, low intelligent way to look at this film and these slasher films in general and these Friday Thirteenth films. I mean, sure, maybe there's one or two slasher films that try to make that point, but that's not what slasher films are really about. Um, like, the Friday 13th films with the kids having sex and all that, that was never meant to, like, send any message of, like, oh, you're doing something naughty, so you're going to be killed. Uh, no, that was something that people just, like, added to the series, like, later on in their own minds. And then some of the later movies did try to, like, add that element into it. But that's not what this franchise started as, and that's not what the majority of the films were ever meant to say. Like, the whole thing about people having sex and getting killed is just because these films were made for the teenage market, and that's what teenagers do. They're horny. They have sex. That's the way it is. That's what teens do. They want to bang. That was all it is. It was just meant to show what teenagers do realistically. That was it. There was never meant to be anything more to it than that. But people just started adding, like, their own ideals to it and all that, and critics, I'm just thinking that this was some, like, morality play about punishing teenagers and all that just really stupid just completely overthinking this simple movie some people say there's a hint here that maybe there was like a relationship between alice and steve christie but i never got that she was really into steve christie or that there was any kind of relationship between the two i just got that steve christie had the hots for her and that maybe she was just like contemplating it but not really into it because she doesn't seem very receptive of him like you know touching her face here and all that <laughs> Yeah, it would have been cool to know at least a little bit of backstory about Jason's father. But at the same time, though, I don't think you really needed it for this first film. It would might have been something interesting to like bring up in maybe the second one or the third. But uh, I, I don't think you absolutely needed it for this first flick because it's completely just centered on the uh, Pamela Voorhees character or Mrs. Voorhees character. Like the name Pamela wasn't introduced to, I believe, like part four, her first name. They just call her Mrs. Voorhees in this. And I know what I'm I know what I'm about to say is kinda like jumping ahead and all that, but yeah, at this point in the uh movies, Jason is dead. Like there's no like uh, inkling of like Jason going to like come back or anything like that. Which is fine. I'm fine with that. Um this is much. This is much more of a grounded movie, which is fine. It's but this is really just a completely simple like revenge tale from this crazy woman, a woman who has went crazy. I mean, because of the death of her son. Part two, when they bring in Jason and all that, and make it known that Jason is the killer. We put in part two. They pretty much we they try to throw in the idea, or we get the idea at least at that time that. Jason drowned, but he may have survived his drowning. Like, we don't know for sure if Jason, like, survived his drowning or if he's some type of, like, quasi-undead, you know, thing or something. They never completely explain what Jason is in the second movie. They just kind of hint at it that he might have survived his drowning and been living in the woods. And so that begs the question of why didn't he ever go, like, find his mom or anything, you know, or go back to her. But I've always looked at it as Jason's mentally handicapped. I mean, he is. So I just looked at it as he was probably just scared and terrified after his drowning and ran off into the woods to be by himself and probably couldn't even find his way back to his mom and then when search parties were like looking for his body or whatever he probably just hid from them and then by the time that he discovered his mom uh, back at the camp uh, he probably saw her head get chopped off at the, from the ending of this movie and then that pushed him over the edge even more and so to me that just made the most sense right there And even though there are some logic, little bit of still a little bit of logic jumps in that explanation I just said, at the same time, I think it works good enough for a slasher B movie popcorn series like this. And I like the fact that in part two, Jason is like this urban legend, you know, because you don't really know if what the kids are saying about Jason in part two actually happened or if it was the way it was. Like, we just kind of assume it was.
Like, some of the things are confirmed in part two that Jason did see his mom get his head chopped off because otherwise he wouldn't know who Alice was and he wouldn't be seeking revenge for her in the opening of part two. And he wouldn't have his mom's head, so obviously he saw her get her head chopped off because he went and got the damn thing. Um, so some of that's true, but at the same time, uh, the whole implication that uh, the Jenny character comes up with in part two that Jason may have, like, survived his drowning and all that and, like, grew up in the woods and stuff. Like, we don't know how much of that is actually true or, like, what Jason actually is, if he is human or undead. So you can just kind of see it either way in the second, because they treat it as, like, an urban legend story, pretty much. And I kind of like that. And I think it works, in the basis of it being, like, a campfire tale. And truthfully, you could, like, just completely skip this movie and go straight to part two. And this movie almost acts as more of a prequel to the series, really. But at the same time, I wouldn't recommend skipping this one because, I, like I said, I do think this is a good, fun movie. But I do think a lot of the sequels are more entertaining than this one just because of the Jason factor. I like this when the, the Annie character, who's going to be the cook, like freaks out jumps out of the jeep to get away from the killer, who we don't know at this point, of course, is Mrs. Voorhees, Betsy Palmer. She's leaping out. She tucked and rolled. What's funny is uh, horror fans know that Jason's mother is the killer in this one and not Jason, but a lot of people today, like mainstream audience-wise... They, a lot of people still probably don't know or uh, understand or get that Jason wasn't the killer in this first movie. Like, I saw the sequels before this one, so when I went back and watched this one, I was like, uh, at first I was a little confused because I was like, eh, that's not Jason. And then there's like, you know, the mom, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Because you see, most people have seen the sequels before this original, so they'll just be like, well, where's Jason at first? And then they'll be like, oh, the mother, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of neat. Really, when you think about it. Because this first movie is like so far back now. Because it came out in 1980. And we're like up to... If you count the new TV series that's going to come out. It'll be the 13th, Friday the 13th product. So this movie is so long ago. I love the special effects here. Of course, all done by Tom Savini. Great effects in this movie that still hold up. She gets her throat slit. Great prosthetic work. Of course, here coming up, we got the part where Ned fakes drowning, which was, of course, obvious that he was faking. Of course, if you look at the killer's hand here from their POV, you can see they're wearing like a school ring. So Mrs. Voorhees still wears her class ring. <laughs>
Of course, if you're the viewer watching this, you know this Ned dude is faking drowning. Yeah, another interesting thing about this original is they're still presenting it as a murder mystery. Unlike all the other ones where you just know it's Jason. <clears throat> Coming up here, we got the death of the real snake, where they kill the real snake here. Not sure why they bothered to actually kill a real snake. You could have just, like, they could have rigged up a fake snake. I guess they just wanted to make it look as authentic as possible, but, I mean, they could have just gotten a fake snake. I'm sure Tom Savini could have made one that looked pretty good. At this point in time, this is like a good fun movie. <clears throat> a good fun slasher flick. I will say this, there's maybe a little bit too many lulls like in this movie where it kind of slows down a little bit too much. I do think the pacing is better in some of the sequels. But at the same time though, that's because this movie's still coming off like the 70s like style of horror where it was more about, uh, still had some more, like, focus on suspense building and all that, kind of like Halloween did still. We got Ned going around doing a joke about Indians and all that and smacking his mouth. Today, that would probably get Ned canceled. <laughs> of course, back then, though, people uh, watching this would just think it was just an innocent, harmless joke and him just being goofy. But nowadays, the people on Twitter would scream that it was cultural appropriation or something. And they would write up like 10 essays about the character Ned and why Ned shouldn't be making jokes like this. Which would be completely overthinking the movie. <laughs> You don't really think about uh, certain things when you watch this movie for the first time or even the first few times, but um, since it's been like so many years since this original, uh, it does make you kind of wonder like what Mrs. Voorhees' is, uh, regular life is like. Like what does she do, you know, to get by on uh, like day to day, you know? Like, what's her normal standard job? Who knows? What I like about this franchise is that Jason and, like, the killings and stuff are 
relegated to uh, the camp area. So it's like, you know, a campground tail and all that, and Jason uh, haunts the campground, which is pretty neat. Here comes another crazy Ralph scene. <laughs> Every time he says I'm a messenger of God, I always crack up. This place is cursed. Cursed. Ralph rides one mean bicycle. <laughs> It does, it does, of course, beg the question of, like, what the hell is wrong with Ralph? Why is he so obsessed about this place? But at the same time, though, he's such a, like, a fun character that it doesn't really matter. But yeah, I would say, yeah, I, I like this. I like this first film. It is a good movie for what it is. But uh, uh, most of a lot of the sequels I do find more entertaining and more enjoyable slasher films than this original. I like uh, watching these movies now. I used like I used to feel different about some of these movies, but watching them now, I like Friday Thirteenth Part Two better than this first one. I think this first one is better than Friday Thirteenth Part Three, though, which I think is the work the, uh, the weakest of the first three. And I think Friday the 13th Part 4 is easily better than uh, this movie. This is better than Friday 5, which I know has a cult following, but that film has never really grown on me much. I don't hate it, but I've never been like a huge fan of it. And Jason Lives is easily better than this film. Jason Lives is the best one of the series. And even though watching part watching part seven before, I used to think it was just kind of like an all right time waster. Watching part seven again, I would even say I like that one more than this one. Only just because of, once again of the entertainment Jason factor. Jason's just like so much cooler than uh, the mother character, which that's not a slide against like Betsy Palmer or anything. I think she does well here. She's the best actor in the movie. I think the Mrs. Voorhees character is good, but you just can't compete with the icon of Jason and how just cool. Jason is, just how much cool he oozes. He oozes. You just can't do it. So just for entertainment factor alone, I enjoy part seven more than this one. Or I, I guess I enjoy watching part seven more than this one because of entertainment factor, but I think this one may be a slightly better movie than part seven, though, I guess I should say. And this is easily better than part eight. Even though part eight, I will say, has moved up a little for me. Like part eight, I used to think was just kind of like a passable movie. Now I can kind of watch it and have like an all right time with it just for the Jason factor. Like an alright time killer five time with it. At this point though, the movie's starting to drag a little and you're kinda wanting it to get to like another death. And speaking of another death, Ned's about to bite it. It's off screen though, but I like the suspense of it. Jason Goes to Hell is one is another movie, like Part 9, that I've never hated. Um, I know a lot of people like hate that movie, and I, I used to like not like it that much, but the unrated cut has like grown on me over the years. Like the theatrical cut, I never hated, but I never like... 
<clears throat> I never loved it or really liked it that much either. But I will say the unrated cut, though, has grown on me over the years. I think it has amazing gore. And I think if you can just accept the movie for what it is and for the direction it goes, I think it's ultimately a good entertaining horror flick. Just not a just not a good um, standard Friday 13th movie. And then Jason X, I think, is a good fun one. I think Jason X is kind of underrated. It has like a cult following now, but I still think it's a little underrated. I, I think that is a good, fun B-movie. Fred vs. Jason I still really enjoy. Not a perfect movie or a masterpiece, but a really fun movie. The remake, I'm not really into. But uh, maybe it'll grow on me. I like this explanation, though, of the, the characters like Dream she's been having and all that, about rain and blood and all that. It helps set a good, like, spooky mood. And of course, it does begin to rain. Because this type of stuff only happens during storms. In the middle of nowhere. And in New Jersey. Coming up on the bacon sex scene. I will say this, the Alice character or whatever is not the most interesting of, like, the final girls of this series. There's much better, like, final uh, hero characters in this franchise as it goes along. It's not that she's bad, she's just not really that interesting. She's kind of just another, like, Jamie Lee Curtis archetype type character where she's not as interested in sex and all that as the other ones are. But she still smokes the weed and stuff just like uh, Jamie Lee Curtis did in Halloween. It's just not one of those situations where she's the most, like, homely, so she gets to live. Bacon's getting it on. I 
I like this, though, how the camera raises up and, like, Ned's body is, like, in the bunk above him. That's pretty creepy. Yeah, poor Ned. He didn't make it. <laughs> We're about 40, um, 40 minutes into this. Into this movie. So we're pretty much about at the halfway point. Strip Monopoly. I've never been a fan of Monopoly. The game, shit takes forever to get the game over with. And half the time, I just end up quitting or just allowing myself to lose just so everybody else can keep playing because I just get wore out. Got some good boobs here. Not bad. At this point, this is a murder mystery, and they're, they're still kind of going with, uh, you know, who's the suspect, who might be doing it, or who maybe is in on it. At this point, it really seems like the the Bill character here, who was kind of hinted he might be in on it when he had, like, the machete putting it on his shoulder after killing the snake and trying to, like, strike a I'm a badass pose. Kind of seems like he's probably not really in on it, but at the same time, at this point, it kind of seems like Steve Christie, the guy who runs the place, might be the killer. I do think they could have done a little bit more to play with a little bit more suspects and stuff like that at this point. Kevin Bacon is lighting a smoke. I believe that is a joint. And it's going to be the last one he ever smokes. <laughs> I love this death, though, right here. With the, the blood dripping on Kevin Bacon's head and the arrow through the bottom of the, underneath the bunk. Awesome death scene. Awesome uh, makeup effects. Kevin Bacon's girlfriend going to the bathroom. This will be the last piss she ever takes. I do think this movie would probably be a bit too slow for modern audiences, which is why a lot of them would probably prefer like the later sequels that have more action and stuff going on. Same thing with the original Halloween. I don't think it would play as well to modern audiences today.
I probably won't do another commentary for Freddy vs. Jason since I already did one during the my reviews for the Freddy movies. Or commentaries for the Freddy movies, I mean. And if you, my opinion on it still pretty much stands the same. So if you want to know what my opinion is on Freddy vs. Jason, uh, you can just listen to that commentary I've already done for when I did the Freddy commentaries. Because it's pretty much the same as it, is, it was then. I will say there's not, like, a lot to these characters in terms of character. Like, it felt like there was a little bit more to the characters than something like the first Halloween. Because they felt more, like, three-dimensional, like, well-rounded characters. Because I Probably because they were all, like, kind of friends with each other. Here, this feels like more of just, like, a, a group of random teens put together. Instead of people who are friends with each other. So you don't feel as much of that connection as you did in something like the first Halloween. Love this axe kill coming up here. And I like how you see like the shadow of it raise up behind her. That's pretty cool. Before she turns around, it takes her out. I will say this, the kills are the best part of this movie, so it does make you feel a little bit vapid that it doesn't have like more going on for it than just the kills. Okay, it would have been nice to have a little bit more character in this. Of course, Alice is about to take off her shirt, but you don't get to see anything because uh, the game gets interrupted by the storm. Coincidence. <laughs> If you hear any movement in the background, of course, that's just because I'm moving around. <laughs> I get um, tired of sitting in the same place or the same way after a while. I like to situate myself. Here we're cutting back to the diner. Now, Steve Christie, at this point, if you thought he was a suspect, it, uh, he kind of isn't anymore because there's no way he could have been at the camp that fast and then went straight to this friggin' diner. There's just no way. So at this point, it's like, well, shit, it isn't Steve Christie. Well, who could it be? Maybe the truck driver from the opening. I mean, you never know. Or at this point, maybe it is Crazy Ralph. Steve Christie heading back to Crystal Lake. Big mistake, Steve.
I like how you can kind of tell the killer's like hiding behind the shower curtain or whatever, the bathroom curtain. Yeah, you can see the killer's hand, which is kind of neat, kind of creepy. Like, the difference with something like this, as opposed to, like, the Terrifier movies, is this movie, uh, like, it, it is light on character and more about the gore and stuff, but at the same time, though, it's much more fun than, like, the Terrifier movies, so even if I do have some problems with it, like, with being kind of light on character, it's just much more entertaining. Of course, Steve Christie's Jeep just randomly breaks down for no reason. But yeah, Sean Cunningham seems to be extremely resentful of these movies. Like, he always wanted to be, like, a more important or a bigger director than what he was. Which... I mean, I understand that, wanting to be more, you know, in life and all that, but at the same time, if you find a niche and you're good at it, you should stick to that niche. You, we're not all meant to be like a Kubrick or Scorsese when it comes to movies. I mean, not everybody is meant to be that. Like, Sean Cunningham should have just accepted that he's meant to be the horror guy. That's who he is. And that should he should have just accepted that, in my opinion. But I can understand why he wouldn't want to, but at the same time, though... In my opinion, he should have just accepted it. I love this, how the character like thinks she hears like a child calling out for her and all that. Of course, come to find out it's Mrs. Voorhees imitating a child's voice. Really creepy. Yeah, this is much more of like a suspense murder mystery than the uh, other films after this. Yeah, this is creepy as hell when she's like getting called out by a child's voice and all that. Makes you wonder like what the hell's going on. At this point you could even think, well maybe it is supernatural. Five minutes into the movie. Almost nobody left. I don't know if I would like go wandering like all the way into the woods to try to find somebody. 
Once again, sorry if you hear background noise. It's just me situating myself again. But of course, she wants to do the right thing, you know, to see if this person's okay. So she is willing to like wander off to try to uh, really far to find this person. But it's a setup. We don't actually see the death, which in a way um, might piss some people off <laughs> because of so much buildup we get to it. But I like that you don't see what happens, though. I think it makes it a little bit scarier in that instance. But yeah, Alice says our main hero here is just not that interesting. Adrian King's character isn't. Bill's going off to check the generator, but he's never coming back. Actually, I think they go check the truck out first. Or Jeep, I'm not sure which. So they think about just driving out of here or walking out. I think they find the axe in the bed right here, which, yeah, adds to the creep factor. That's some scary shit. <laughs> Like once I seen that axe in the bed, that's when I'd be like, okay, we getting the hell out of here. I would go like make a hollering cry or whatever rally cry to try to uh, tell everybody else to show up and all that, or leave a note or something in case anybody else was there. But then I would get the hell out of there and I would go straight to try to find the police. I would hike my ass out of there. No matter how many miles it was to the nearest phone.
I like this tracking shot where we see that the phone line's been cut. Pretty cool. Like I said, there's some good directing here by Sean Cunningham. Yeah, that's what she talks about. Let's just hike out of here. And the bill dude's like, it's like so many miles to the nearest phone. I'm like, I don't give a damn. I'd rather take my chances of hiking out of here. Just on the road. I'd rather take my chances that a random car might come by and all that than to sit here in like a sitting duck with a friggin' axe in the bed. Like prank or no prank, even if I suspected this could be a prank, I wouldn't want to test it. With a friggin' bloody axe in there and the vehicle being tore up and the friggin' phone line's not working. That's a little bit too much. That would be too much of a hardcore prank for anybody, even Ned. I like this kind of talk right here, though, with the cops, like, telling Steve Christie about it's Friday the 13th, we have more accidents and everything, it's just, like, a bad luck day and all that. I like that, that helps, like, see, little stuff like that helps, like, set an atmosphere for a movie. I enjoy that kind of stuff. But yeah, like the whole like a craziness from Roger Ebert and all that when this movie came out, like trying to like send out Betsy Palmer's address and everything, which she didn't even give the right address from what I heard, so she never even received a single letter. <laughs> it was just like so stupid, like in, trying to encourage viewers to like write to Betsy Palmer and tell her how disappointed they were in her. She's an actor. She was doing a job. That's so ridiculous. Childish. Like, Roger Ebert and all that is, like, well, him and Siskel were, like, respected because they were the first one to, like, do a critic arguing, like, movie review show and all that. But truthfully, like, as far as, like, as critics go, a lot of their opinions, at least on horror films, were terrible. Their viewpoint was always one of those, like, morality things like like that people try to say where they're like well i get it's just the movie but what about all the stupid people out there they're not going to understand it's going to make them go crazy which is such a dumb angle Steve Christie's dead, killed off camera. That's another thing. This movie's not as gory as, like, people remember it being. This is still, it's just got more gore in it than what was, like, in the slasher films, basically, at the time, like, Halloween and stuff. But overall, it's not that gory, really. This is still very much in that, like, suspense vein of, like, Halloween and Alfred Hitchcock and stuff. Still trying to ape some of that. And in terms of, like, taking from Halloween, this movie takes a lot more from, like, Bay of Blood than it does anything. Which I believe had already come out at this point. Like Mario Bava. I think it was Mario Bava. It may it may have been somebody else. I'm not for sure. But the Italian like um, Jallo flick. I think it was a Jallo flick. Bay of Blood. I th um, this takes way more from that than it does Halloween. Or at least just as much. That's the thing about this movie that is kind of a weakness of it. It, does, it takes all these elements from stuff, other horror, other popular horror movies, but it doesn't reinvent them or anything. It just kind of just uses them in its own way. But it doesn't add anything to them, like Halloween elevated a lot of the tropes and stuff like that, things it took from Black Christmas. This movie doesn't elevate anything. It just embraces what's already been done and tries to have fun with it, which I'm fine with. We're an hour and five minutes into this sucker. Moving into the third act. Now Bill is going to check the generator. Goodbye, Bill. Like I said, though, the Alice character is just not that interesting. Like, her surviving up until this point, you're like, why? 
like the other the other chick who like heard the voice or whatever outside and all that and went to follow it like the childlike voice and was killed off screen her character had more charisma on screen the actress did anyway and the chick that's playing alice adrian king and nothing against adrian king she seems like a real nice woman but yeah that other chick felt like she had like more on-screen charisma than the than adrian king does and she probably would have been a more interesting or better final girl just because she had more of a likability factor about her from natural charisma <coughs> sorry about that cough Bill, you picked the wrong time to check the generator. Yeah, at this point, you're wondering, who the hell is the killer? Are there multiple killers? Bill's dead, Alice. Sorry to tell you. <laughs> Bill ain't gonna make it, baby. We now present to you Alice making coffee. She walked by the pantry. I kept. I started to expect Crazy Ralph to pop out. I guess at this point, you'd probably think the killer is probably Ralph. If you don't already know the twist. Or the surprise ending. Sadly, she goes through all the trouble of making this coffee, and Alice never gets to drink it. She is looking for Bill. Bill dead! <laughs> yeah, Bill ain't gonna make it, baby. Part of me wonders, like, how funny would it have been if Crazy Ralph was actually the killer at the end of this? <laughs> Check the door. I do like the surprise here and just the gore of, like, Bill being, like, friggin' nailed to the wall with arrows.
Yeah, that's amazing. The gore effects. Alice trying to jerry-rig the door and stuff to keep the killer from getting in. Go, Alice, go. I like that she's smart enough to at least get a ball bat and try to barricade the door. Check the cupboard. It could be Crazy Ralph, Alice. <laughs> that would have been quite the shocker if the killer was in the cupboard and just, like, popped out. But then that would kind of ruin the uh, Mrs. Voorhees showing up and giving her speech and all that. There's the chick that was killed at the archery range. She just got thrown through the friggin' window. Or tossed. At this point, though, you're still thinking, who the hell is the killer? <laughs> Jeep pulls up. Of course, she automatically thinks it's Steve or assumes it's Steve. So she just starts, like, unbarricading the door and getting ready to run out. Mrs. Voorhees, don't trust her, Alice. Don't trust her. <laughs> She's evil. It would have been nice if we would have gotten at least one scene with, like, Steve Christie, like, talking to Mrs. Voorhees and all that. Since, of course, she does know them, and she even states that, so she met him before, like, the 
at Christie's when she was working there as a cook before Jason drowned. At this point, though, you're completely suspect on her showing up because you're like, well, this woman just randomly showed up out of nowhere. She got to be the killer. Because there's no one else left. Although, it would have been interesting if they pulled like a double bait and switch and Crazy Ralph popped out and like murdered her and come to find out Ralph was the killer and it was like a double bait and switch. That might have benefited this movie like more, but in the long run though, this movie works for the franchise much better with, of course, having Mrs. Voorhees as a killer because that leads us to Jason. At this point, you're starting to think that this woman's a little unhinged here, talking about the death of Jason. <laughs> of course, she's telling her backstory now to Alice because, well, Alice is the only one left, so she doesn't really see her as that much of a threat. Of course, we get it that Jason was born on a Friday the 13th, because that's when this movie takes place, and she says today is his birthday, so right off the bat, Jason being born on a Friday the 13th, he's going to be screwed. Because he's born on Bad Luck Day. And of course, it does knock it down a point because it is a cheat that the killer is someone we never saw when this is like a murder mystery movie. In a proper murder mystery, it should have been someone we had seen before at least once. But it is a cheat. The The rule of a murder mystery has been broken here. But at the same time, though, Betsy Palmer's acting is so great here that you really don't care that much. It doesn't bother you too much. Of course, Steve Christie's body just, like, happens to fall when Alice runs over there, like, from the tree. A little coincidental. At the same time, though, the finding of the bodies and all that is taken from the ending of Halloween, where Myers had, like, bodies hidden in a closet cupboard and all that. But it works here because even though this movie takes from Halloween, it still feels more like its own thing. <coughs> Once again, sorry about that cough. Getting a little allergies acting up. That's good. I like how she's like talking like in her son's voice, like with a split personality. Yes, yeah, kind of a reverse psycho, but I think it works here in the context of this movie watching it. Right here, Alice is getting the gun, but of course the bullets are in a locked drawer, so it doesn't really make any difference. Let that be a lesson to you people. Do not keep your bullets locked in a drawer which you cannot get into to put them in your gun, unless of course you have kids or something. Yeah, you're fucked. You can't get to the bullets.
And one interesting thing to think about is what if Pamela had succeeded and killed Alice? I mean, what would she do? I'm assuming that she would just like get rid of the bodies like, in her Jeep and all that, just throw them out and dump them and then just take off and go back home and just start living her life normal again and all that. I mean, not counting, of course, the sequels where we find out Jason is alive and all that. But, um, yeah, I assume that's what she would do. And if they just if they reopened the camp again, she would be there to once again murder whoever the hell's there. Of course, I hate this. Alice knocks Mrs. Voorhees down, and she doesn't, like, continue to, like, finish the job. Once she took her down, she could have, like, been beating her in the head with the freaking gun and everything, like, trying to finish her off. But Alice just runs off, no double tap. Really stupid. I kind of let some of that go, of course, because she's supposed to be just, like, an average girl. So she's probably not wanting to just, like, you know, battle it out, like, hardcore and beat the shit out of Mrs. Voorhees. But at the same time, this chick's trying to kill you, so you would think she would double tap. I like that Alice was able to, like, hide from Mrs. Voorhees and outsmart her. Nice shots of the moon with, like, Betsy Palmer's face, like, silhouetted over it. Pretty cool. And, of course, the ch ch ha ha or kill-kill-mom-mom score in this is amazing and iconic. The score in this is great. Even though it is kind of a riff from Psycho, it's still great. Yeah, movie's about over. Uh, this one went by kind of fast. Most of these like movies I, re I do commentaries for and stuff, I always almost always say they go by kind of fast because I usually do commentaries or I've like almost always done commentaries for movies I like. So uh, yeah, they always tend to go by pretty fast. Hiding in the cupboard, copying Crazy Ralph. All right, Alice. <laughs> At this point, I'd be trying to find me some kind of weapon. Even if it was like a glass thing of milk or something, I could try to split her brains out with it. I like the twisting of the pantry doorknob and stuff like that, like behind Alice. That's pretty cool. Good shot. So Voris is hacking down the door with the machete, which becomes Jason's signature weapon. I suppose the machete is the signature weapon of the Voorhees family in general. Like, if we ever see Jason's father in, a, in the prequel show, I hope he's using the machete at least once. She's got her bleeding. I 
I mean, right there, Mrs. Voorhees is bleeding, so it makes sense Alice might think she's out or done for. But at the same time, you're like, double tap, chick, double tap. I do think it is kind of stupid how she just, like, casually walks outside and sits in front of the lake. Like, oh, it must be over. It's like, that's, you're, you're dumb. You should be still on guard and just in case something might happen. Or she might still be alive. I do like that Alice is a fighter, though. She's a bit of a scrapper. But it is kind of weak that Mrs. Voorhees was able to take all these people out. Now she's, like, struggling with this Alice character. Even though she did kind of, like, get the drop on most of those other people, and it wasn't really, like, a fist fight or anything. If she's strong enough to, like, toss that chick through the window, though, you expect her to put up a little bit more of a fight with Alice. Yeah, decent movie just went to a good movie. She just got her, Mrs. Voorhees just got her head chopped off. Great shot. Yeah, acting wise, Betsy Palmer does great. Even though, like, her struggling with Alice and all that is kind of, kind of campy. She shouldn't be having that much trouble with her. It should be much more of, like, a one-sided fight with Alice somehow, like, outwitting her or something like that and taking her out. Because Mrs. Voorhees should be a little tougher because she was able to throw that, toss that chick through the window, I mean. Alice jumping into the canoe. Now, her getting into the canoe and, like, going out on the lake is like, huh? Because, I mean, if she wanted to get away from it all, why wouldn't she just hike out of there? She killed the killer. Why didn't she just hike out of there if she wanted to get away from everything? I mean, why go out to the canoe? The killer's dead. Comes the popo. Of course, no explanation for who the fuck called the police. I mean, why are they here? And even though, of course, this is a dream sequence, when she wakes up, the police have found her and gotten her, so who the hell called them? Why are they there? Not really any explanation given. This jump scare is really good right here, though, with, of course, the decomposed dead Jason, child Jason, coming out of the water. Great jump scare. I actually liked it if it would have just ended there with the decomposed zombie kid Jason like coming out of the water for vengeance for his mother. Like coming back to life for revenge for his mother. I think that would have actually been a more powerful final shot for the movie. 
making it a dream just kind of knocks the film down a little bit more to just be like, eh, decent. Of course, I do like this ending, though. Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. Then he's still there. <laughs> You see, like, the ripples in the, the lake or whatever that kind of, like, you know, was it a dream or wasn't it? Like, air bubbles or whatever. But Sean Cunningham has conf confirmed it's a dream. But in context of just the movie, it's like, was it a dream or wasn't it? Are those air bubbles? Did Jason actually come back? Is something supernatural actually happening? Or is it just a dream? In context of the movie, though, that's the way it plays it. According to the director, though, and the writer, it is just a dream. So, but I think it works better, like, for the ambiguousness of just in the movie, really. I think it's kind of spookier. Yeah, overall, three out of four. Good slasher movie. I liked it. Good murder mystery slasher flick. Not perfect, but a good one. Uh, and fun. I like the ending with like the whole imp, the little, like, looks like air bubbles coming up out of the lake. Like, was it a dream or wasn't it? Did Jason actually come back or is it just BS? Is it just in her nightmare? What happened? Yeah, add some good spookiness to it. Yeah, overall, solid three out of four. Good movie. Uh, enjoyable. So thank you guys for being here for my commentary and I will see you with Friday the 13th part two.